Helldiver12905 reads books about winning. That's why he always wins. Reginald here. I understand that bots are challenging compared to bugs for a lot of players. Personally, I prefer them. They're more dynamic and engaging to me, more of a challenge. But I also do understand why many seem not to like them. Thus, I am making an advanced tutorial on how to fight them. This tutorial is not going to be about what all the weak spots are, or which weapons are best, and all the stuff everyone has already done ad nauseum. There are numerous excellent tutorials on this subject already, so I will be bringing up that kind of information only where it is relevant. I'll even link a few of those guys below for you, ones that I found useful. Instead, I am going to fill your mind with deliciously advanced subject matter from all around the world on the subject of small infantry tactics and advanced military strategy. I will bring to you techniques from American military field manuals, techniques from the 100 Years War, and literally Sun Tzu, and turn them into usable methods that will help you win games and educate you about some cool stuff at the same time. Before we get to all those cool subjects, I want to make sure you know this video is carefully timestamped, the roadmap of this video is on on screen below, and furthermore, I want to specify that this guide is intended for standard play, with three to four people, including randoms, and not necessarily for solo players or pre-made groups, though obviously pre-made groups will benefit from this information too. Also, while I was editing this, I discovered it will need to be a multi-part series, so stay tuned for other parts. With the techniques I'm going to outline in this tutorial, you will hopefully gain a new set of tools to facilitate you winning the game while playing by whatever means and using whatever gear is most fun for you, though your choice of gear will certainly make things harder harder or easier, that's absolutely true. And as a consequence, I'm going to outline what I think the best build is for a player who is specifically struggling with bots. Not the best build, period, the best build for someone suffering while facing them. And we will, right after we get into the good stuff. I'm going to introduce you to a key technique for fighting bots, especially their patrols, the ambush. Yes, I know everyone knows what this is, but what does it mean to execute one well? Let's cover that in detail to start, then let's move into more cerebral things. The ambush. Got some patrols over here. Yeah. Oh, they're coming over here. Yes, they are. Quite a few infantry. I've got an EMS I can drop on them. Yeah, I hit him with the EMS so we could pop their infantry. I'll try to get their infantry going as soon as you drop it on them. I might have been a terrible throw. Oh, that was decent, actually. All the infantry are down. Nice. They're dead. This weapon is painful. Textbook ambush. To discuss the ambush, I need to teach you about a key modern military concept called enfilading fire. What in the heck is that? Well, it's French by way of a bunch of English nobility from the Hundred Years' War, and it is a form of flanking, but specifically, it is detailing the best way to attribute fire into a group of enemies. It's not about specifically flanking as a movement technique, it is about where to position yourself to maximize damage into a group of enemies while minimizing risk to yourself using modern weaponry or, at the time, arrows. And I suppose crossbow bolts, too. I'm not going to be talking to you about in enfilade or in difilade or any of that. I'm going to be talking about enfilading fire and the orientation of enemies in plain terms. What you want is to achieve a row of enemies and hit them from the side. That looks like this. You can technically achieve the same result if you hit a patrol head on and the patrol is marching to you in a single or double column. You can even achieve this effect if the enemy is marching away from you in a single or double column. The point is that the enemy is essentially in a single file line of some kind or mostly single file kind of line and you are firing into that line on on the short side so that the long side of the enemy is always just something you're shooting at. The result is that as enemies die, you start hitting the things immediately behind them, and you can fire freely with minimal effort and aim. The upside for this isn't just that it's easier for you, it's also harder for the enemy. Take a look at this example of the enemy shooting themselves, attempting to shoot me, thus benefiting me dramatically. Bots aren't very smart, and they're not sentient, so they will obviously shoot each other without any concern. This shields you from incoming enemy fire while simultaneously preventing all of the enemies from engaging you at once. This reduces the overall capacity and effect effectiveness of the enemy group while maximizing your own effectiveness. In Helldivers 2, there are some downsides. Not every weapon you have is going to be able to penetrate multiple enemies. However, if you can kill all the key targets this way before sinking into the, some of the heavier ones, you'll essentially reduce the enemy by significant numbers before you have to worry about maneuvering. Taking a position like this and firing is called enfilading fire. When fighting bots, target selection in an ambush is absolutely critical. And this goes for actually all of the fights, obviously, but I want to clarify what the high threat targets are 
here. It's a little different than what you think. The biggest threat when conducting an ambush on a patrol, or any other base for that matter, is not the Hulk, the Devastator, the tank, whatever else is patrolling. It is the infantry, the raiders. The reason for that, even though they're generally weak enemies and easy to kill and don't do that much damage typically, is because they have the capacity to fire flares, and flares can summon an entire dropship army on a level 9. I've seen as many as 6 or 7 dropships come in off of one flare, which will turn your ambush into an ambush on you. That is pretty unpleasant when it happens. Thus, what is absolutely critical is before you launch any ambush, you have a solid count on the enemy selection that is coming towards you. You want to know precisely how many infantry you need to kill and how quickly before you decide whether or not to launch your ambush. Usually you're making this decision on the fly as a patrol scoots past. So, how do you decide whether or not you've seen everything? Well, there are generally two rules I use. I check my map a lot, keep an eye on it, and I wait. I wait a while. I make sure that there isn't two little infantry bots scurrying up the hill a little slow in the back. Once I'm satisfied that I've seen everything in the patrol, then I make my target selections. If you are on comms with your team, whether that's a pre-made or a random, it is excellent to suggest that everybody pick a set of infantry to kill. If you can't kill that set of infantry and one of them pops off a flare, you're gonna have a very bad time. A good deciding factor on whether or not you should attack a patrol is whether or not you think you can kill all the infantry before someone pops off a flare. This should be the highest priority target for everyone in the group, so please keep an eye out and make sure you're targeting that. After raiders, you can go after whatever you want. However, I will warn you that those striders, the walkers with the two legs, if their driver gets knocked out of the vehicle without dying, he can shoot a flare, and it has happened to me where I was shooting at a strider, I blew the driver out of it, he popped on the ground and started firing, and while the strider was falling, I couldn't shoot him. So I'm going to strongly recommend that striders be very carefully watched and their drivers be eliminated where possible. This is one area where stun grenades can actually serve you very well. It is sometimes necessary to ambush a small base or minor fortification. In such cases, there are sometimes heavily armored enemies, and sometimes a patrol has a heavily armored enemy, actually usually a hulk in most patrols at high level games. It may be useful if you have a coordinated team to designate someone as your armor killer to take on that armored target while the rest of you kill the infantry. Now I'm not a military man, so my designation may be off here but the Infantry Rifle Platoon and Squad Manual FM3-21.8 can be found on Wikipedia. It was published by the Headquarters Department of the Army, March 2007, with a distribution of approved public release, distribution being unlimited, so I'm going to quote you some stuff out of this. In Chapter 9, Actions on the Objective, Ambush is listed, and there's a whole bunch of technical data here. We're on about page 325 if you're reading it the same way I am. I'm going to skip into uh, section 966, just for the sake of brevity and our understanding of the subject matter. Based on the amount of time available to set an ambush, ambushes are hasty and deliberate. Those are the two types. A hasty ambush is conducted based on an unanticipated opportunity. It is used when a patrol sees the enemy before the enemy sees them, and the patrol has time to act. The leader gives the pre-arranged signal to start the action, and all soldiers move to conceal the firing positions, prepare to engage the enemy. Depending on the mission, the patrol may allow the enemy to pass if the enemy does not detect the patrol. So what's going on here is you're going to want to take some sort of covered position, and then keep an eye on the enemy as they move along. And then someone can make a decision whether to engage or not, and ideally this would be all coordinated with with comms. A deliberate ambush is conducted against a specific target at a location chosen based on intelligence. With deliberate ambush, leaders plan and prepare based on detailed information that allows them to anticipate enemy actions in enemy locations. Detailed information includes type and size of target, organization or formation, routes and direction of movement, time the force will reach or pass certain points on its route and weapons and equipment carried. This is more like assaulting a small base I was just talking about. Now it's fairly common for players to just sort of scallywag their way in there and have some fun, and that's totally fine, I'm not objecting to that, but it could be useful to say generate some sort of ambush condition where a group or a couple of you sort of scout out what's going on and then both agree to different sections to target and that can make a very effective base stomp very quick and easy with limited stratagem usage there are lots of ways to construct your ambush but i'm just going to cover two there's the linear ambush and the l-shaped ambush i've got the pictures from the manual up on screen here but i'm just going to sort of explain as quickly as possible with a linear ambush this is going to happen to you a lot your patrol is going by you guys quick dump into cover you realize that you have seen all of the enemies and you could probably take them all out. There's maybe three or four bots, a couple of devastators, and a hulk. And you think to yourself, if we kill the bots and take all of this stuff out, that would actually free us up to maneuver instead of having to deal with the patrol wandering around. Since everybody's probably moving as a group in this case, you may end up in sort of a linear perspective on the enemy, simply firing at them from one side. That's a perfectly acceptable way to launch an ambush. Another good way to launch an ambush if you have a little more time to repair is an L-shaped ambush. This would be especially useful when fighting one of those bases I 
I mentioned before. An L-shaped ambush is very simple. Let's just assume for a moment we're taking a patrol. If you know in advance where the patrol is moving, you could set some people up on one side of it, just like a linear ambush, behind cover. As the patrol moves to pass, one of your guys could simply enter that enfilading fire position and expose the enemy's rear to them. Thus, three of you are firing in linear fashion and one of them is firing into the rear of the enemy, taking down those priority targets. I want to show off one more image here real quick and just mention something as we're covering this ground. This is an armor killer detachment, but the support security team in this image could easily just be a couple of dudes firing on the infantry while the two other dudes are firing on the tanks. It doesn't really matter. What I want to talk about here is the scale. You see, Helldivers 2, it's often easy to forget your guns reach really far. It's fully possible to be firing at an enemy 100 meters away, although the accuracy is going to fall off a lot, and that's why ambushes tend to be conducted close in order to maximize damage. Still, it's not always the case that firing at enemies really close is desirable. If you have accurate weapons, it's fully viable to shoot a small patrol down from a significant distance, preventing it from launching any flares, and even if it does launch flares, you can easily retreat. This is especially valuable against bots, as they have somewhat poor accuracy at longer ranges, except their rockets. Watch out for the rockets. Hopefully between the images I've shown you here and some of the conversation we've had, I've given you a stronger sense of how to carry out an ambush against bots successfully. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later, but I just want to mention one other key detail about the subject of ambushes, which is the attention of bots. Bots are directional facing. They have eyes in the fronts of their heads. They don't look around too much. So if you don't get in front of them, they won't see you. Let's put a bow on this section with a quote from Sun Tzu. In chapter four, weak points and strong, lines 29 through 33. Military tactics are like unto water for water in its natural course runs away from high places and hastens downward. So in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak. Water shapes its course according to the nature of the ground over which it flows. The soldier works out his victory in relation to the foe whom he is facing. Therefore, just as water retains no constant shape, so in warfare there are no constant conditions. He who can modify his tactics in relation to his opponent and thereby succeed in winning may be called a heaven-born captain. My goal here is not to be proscriptive. It is to be educational. I want to give you tools that you can pull out of your kit to use. Hopefully I've done that with this section. Let's move on to the next one. This section will be that build guide I promised. Let's talk about the defensive elements. A heavy armor with fortified. Alternatively, a medium or light class armor with fortified. 2. Bring the personal shield stratagem. 3. Make sure you bring the vitality booster. If no one else has it, it's your job to bring it. As outlined in Cash Crop's video, this increases your ability to resist headshots by 50%. Offensive. The sickle, sighted into 100 meters, default, adjust as needed during the game. The redeemer or senator. I use the dagger because I'm weird. Three, the quasar cannon. Four, eagle airstrike. And five, if the fourth slot is even available for you, just go ahead and pick your poison on this one. Why? Well, most guides will tell you to take light armor and the auto cannon, especially one of the recon armors. And this does make perfect sense for more experienced players and is probably the best. Maybe. I'm not certain about that right now. What I can tell you is that the single most annoying thing about fighting bots is getting insta-jabbed by one rocket you didn't see coming from behind you or from somewhere over the horizon. Tragedy really. Right. Ooh, okay. This often results in a miserable death spiral as you fail to recover your much needed equipment over and over and over. Despite the headshot critical hit issue, whatever it is, resulting from helmets, at least currently as of right now, not reducing player headshot damage in any way regardless of which helmet is worn, heavy armor with fortified still often allows me to take several serious rocket hits and shots without actually dying. Combined with the shield generator and vitality booster, I am much more often able to avoid serious annoyance and stay alive and use stims with a greater reliability. The trade-offs is that I get annoyed by how long it takes for my fat booty to haul across the terrain. But in a fight, I just die less. That matters, especially to players who are struggling with bots. Now, as I was editing this video, Arrowhead once again proves prompt on their updates and did a big patch on a number of balance issues, including the armor. While they didn't resolve the headshot issue at this time, they did make the armors a lot tougher against bot rockets. So you're not gonna get one shot as hard with lighter armors, but you still get a lot of additional survivability off the heavy armor and don't worry too much about stealth. All you have to do is lay down and crawl and you can get away with quite a bit. So my advice remains the same. The sickle in this case is excellent against bots due to the long engagement range and infinite ammo requiring limited resupply. The quasar cannon can do everything the auto cannon can and more while merely suffering from a low refire rate against smaller enemies like devastator mobs. The eagle airstrike is satisfactory against groups and armor. The redeemer is already known to be great, but the 
Senator has specific uses against bots as a very accurate and reliable Devastator one-shotter if you learn how to use it. This kit is sensible and balanced and is designed to allow you to sort of one-man army your way through the mission, even in some pretty gnarly fights. That doesn't make you invulnerable, but it's certainly going to help. This section will be detailing the subject of terrain. Terrain is very important for making decisions as you're moving around, though most people just kind of don't think about it too much. My goal with this section is to give you some tools to have it in the back of your mind while you play. This will allow you to take advantage of the terrain as you encounter it in the course of play on the fly. I'm not expecting you to construct elaborate strategies around luring someone to the correct location or whatever. The game doesn't work like that. The enemy has infinite numbers, hypothetically, and it is on an increasingly short timer how many enemies show up and they have drops so it's not like you can just eliminate all the enemies on the map and then proceed around comfortably what i'm wanting you to do is be able to recognize where you are in relation to the enemy and what the terrain is like so that you can defeat the enemy on superior terrain sun tzu said if we know that the enemy is open to attack and also know that our men are in a condition to attack but are unaware that the nature of the ground makes fighting impracticable we have still gone only halfway towards victory hence the saying if you know the enemy and know yourself your victory will not stand in doubt. If you know heaven and know earth, you may make your victory complete. Chapter 10, Terrain, Lines 29 and 31. Types of Ground. I was quite excited to leverage the two chapters of Sun Tzu detailing types of terrain and the nine situations. However, these proved a bit too disjointed from the realities of Helldiver's two conflicts. Terrain, however, as always for any fighting force, is a key detail that demands attention and consideration. So I'm going to risk a bit of hubris here and propose my own set of terrain classifications that are relevant to us as Helldivers. These are inspired by the original kinds of ground proposed in the original treatise. 1. Open ground. 2. Difficult ground. 3. Narrow ground. 4. Fortified ground. Before I fully describe these types of ground, I also want to list some modifiers that are extremely relevant to modern or automaton conflicts. Since it's all about guns, rockets, and artillery, they should be pretty self-evident. 1. Range to the enemy. 2. Visibility, as in lines of sight. 3 and 4 are cover and concealment. Rash Tactics has this very well described. It's that bullets do not go through cover. 5. Paths of Escape. As you're moving through your missions, you should be keeping an eye on the local terrain and building an on-the-fly map in your head of what hardcover, concealment, and routes of escape you have at your disposal should things go south. What's basically close to you? It is axiomatically better to have several points of hardcover and multiple routes of escape than no cover and few or no routes of escape. Concealment is only useful for disengaging and escaping, but offers no serious protection and is thus more of a tool before a conflict than during it, though it has its advantages for flanking maneuvers. Many planet tile sets offer different natural values values on the cover, concealment, and routes of escape front, so you'll have to be keeping that in mind when you're picking your landing zones and aggressing against your enemies. Level on Creek was often somewhat light on hardcover and heavy on concealment, which favored a more hit-and-run style of fighting, while more rocky planets can offer more opportunities for posting up for conflict and outcrops and around mountains. Open ground is terrain that is largely featureless with limited or no cover, nor concealment that can be moved through in any direction by either the enemy or yourself. It is best to spend as little time here as possible, and it is a great place to lure or fix enemies for an ambush by fire. Difficult ground is specifically terrain like large hills, cliffs, mud flats, swamps, snowdrifts, and sand dunes. Depending on if you took the muscle enhancement booster, these can slow you down a little or a lot, or make it hard to maneuver in general. This is true for some enemies as well, though not all of them. Thus, you should avoid traversing them while fighting, but force your enemy to fight you while traversing them. Bait your enemy into a bad terrain situation and derive advantage from it. On the subject of narrow ground, this can be most commonly found around steep cliffs and in the gullies between them. Occasionally, bases and extraction points can facilitate this with various types of choke points. As long as you are not under threat by enemies sneaking up on you through such terrain, this terrain can actually be useful at your back as it can serve as a natural choke to draw the enemy into after initiating an attack. Care should be taken to avoid being ambushed yourself. Fortified ground is common across your missions and can be both difficult and narrow ground at the same time. These are basically bot bases, it's really that simple. Attacking these can either be easy or hard and it really depends on the type of base and your gear. But one of the best ways to deal with such terrain is to destroy it, or at least everything inside of it, with stratagems, and after clearing it out, sometimes it's useful to post up in it to fight incoming bot groups. This is hardly an exhaustive list. It's really designed to give you a set of tools to start thinking about the problem, and maybe come up with your own solutions and ways of thinking about the problem. Whatever works for you, and if you have one, your team. The final point for this video will be a relatively brief one. It is on the subject of fighting where the enemy isn't. I'm going to read you a whole bunch of quotes here, and I'm going to pick and choose from the ones that I think reinforce this point. This is totally biased, but I think it's worth your time because I think it assesses what we're talking about here well, and it's always stuck out at me as one of the most interesting things in Sun Tzu's treaties. 
In line 18 of the first chapter of Sun Tzu's treatise, Sun Tzu says, All warfare is based on deception. Line 24 in that same chapter says, Attack him where he is unprepared, appear where you are not expected. In chapter 3, Attack by Stratagem, Sun Tzu says, Hence to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Thus the highest form of generalship is to balk the enemy's plans. The next best is to prevent the junction of the enemy's forces. The next in order is to attack the enemy's army in the field. And the worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities. Later, in line 6, Therefore, the skillful leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting. He captures their cities without laying siege to them. He overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field. In chapter 11, and line 19, Rapidity is the essence of war. Take advantage of the enemy's unreadiness. Make your way by unexpected routes, and attack unguarded spots. Let me tie that together with what's in Chapter 3, Attack by Stratagem. Starting at line 8, It is the rule in war, if our forces are 10 to the enemy's 1, to surround him, if 5 to 1, to attack him, if twice as numerous, to divide our army into 2, if equally matched, we can offer battle, if slightly inferior numbers, we can avoid the enemy, if unequal in every way, we can flee from him. Hence, though an obstinate fight may be made by a small force, in the end it must be captured by the larger force. What am I getting? at here. What is the thread that ties all of these things together? It's pretty simple. If you want to maximize your ability to win games, cheese it. You don't necessarily have to take every fight. Run away from things you don't think you can win against. But that's that's more problems. I'm just gonna grab your supplies and leave. There's no reason to stick around and just try to kill your way through everything. Sometimes that's not practical and isn't even a good idea. Furthermore, there are a lot of weapons that can reach out and kill key objectives or bot fabricators or whatever else from significant distances. I'm talking 300 meters or more. There are a lot of stratagems that can be hucked into a base and then you just leave and the stratagem solves the problem. The average Helldiver is significantly more powerful than a singular bot, but you are going to be fighting hundreds of bots. If you take bad fights, you will die a lot. So instead, your objective, if you want to maximize victories, is to fight where the enemy is weak, fight small numbers of the enemy, keep the enemy numbers small, and run away if things are going badly. This is why keeping an eye on your terrain and your routes of escape in relation to that terrain, as well as your cover and concealment, are key to actually succeeding at winning these games. All right, well, I hope I've given you some new and flexible ways to think about the kinds of problems you're facing when fighting bots. They're a little bit more in depth than just use autocannon to shoot heatsink. Again, that's good advice, but it's rudimentary. We can go a little bit beyond it, and I hope to do so more in the next chapter of this work. This will have to be a two-parter, maybe even a three-parter, because I have plenty here of material that I'd love to cover on how best to fight bots. I do really appreciate you tagging along with me, and I hope you had a lot of fun with this. This was a bit of an experiment of mine, so if you did like it, definitely let me know how it went, how you thought the structure and organization of this strategy guide was. And finally, thank you so much for visiting. I wish you all the best in the upcoming weeks, and smooth victories against those disgusting, smelly robots in the future. Take care. Bye-bye. I made it shoot the other one. Oh, I, I teleported? Sick.